Barnes, it's a little disturbing. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jesse Barnes. I work at the uh, Intel Open Source Technology Center with some of these guys and uh, hopefully some more of you at some point. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, our synchronization work that we're, that we're doing um, right now. <coughs> kind of moving away from, or not necessarily moving away from, but adding, a, adding some additional mechanisms that um, should give us some additional features and kind of give user space some more flexibility. So I, I think most of you know what, what sensors are, um, at least roughly, uh, but we'll go over um, IO barriers, which is actually where I came from. So I remember when I first came to graphics, people talked about sensors and I was used to people talking about barriers and uh, that, that helped me understand it. So I'll chat a little bit about that and then talk about some of the uh, existing implementations of, of fencing and synchronization and uh, talk a little, then get to the NSSC and start with that. So we'll talk about how NSSC is doing things today and, and what we're adding to it. And, um, and also uh, if I, I don't have, have things in the slides on this, but um, talk a little bit about um, some of the future and, and motivation for it. So some things to keep in mind uh, for this talk existing questions. So, um, you know, there are different different ways to, to submit work to your graphics driver uh, and different ways to do synchronization. You might want to do different things, but, you know, say for example, you don't have any buffer handles, you're just doing mallets and you're executing on your GPU or some other operating system. You know, how do you, how do, you do graphical synchronization properly? Um, or what if you're just passing the driver, not a list of, of pointers of, of objects that you're operating on, but just a single pointer so that you know, execute the, the prior commands. Um, or similarly, if you're just submitting commands directly from ring two, like your application you know, unmaps uh, the CPU ring and uses space and starts running on it from there. Um, or you want you know something like Wayland or Service Slinger or X or whatever to do some scheduling itself, uh, independent of what the kernel is doing underneath. Today, the XMM driver doesn't do any scheduling, but that's that's going to be changed shortly as well. Um, and then, additionally, you know, it can be tough to debug um, performance problems or lockups if if all of the um, if all of the the synchronization is done for you implicitly inside the kernel driver. Um, it can be tough to work around that. And in fact, a lot of the bugs we have, a lot of the really tough bugs, tend to be in that area because we're making it jam and trying to figure out what we're what the heck is happening. Or, like the DMA fence was solved, and if you want to synchronize between different hardware blocks, you, know, you can't can't always do that easily all all inside the driver. That's possible, but um, it's nice to be able to do it outside as well. So anyway, keep keep some of these in mind as we as we walk through. So like I said, um, coming from coming from working on I/O and disks way back when, um, you know, we talked a lot about I/O barriers. And of journaling file systems. So typically there you'll you know write your metadata barrier or write your metadata and your and your data I mean barrier so that you know you have um, explicit synchronization points and you know you have consistencies whether it's between your data and your metadata. Um, unfortunately um, in Linux that was a real challenge to add because Linux runs on such a variety of hardware. Some of the some of the storage devices that we run on top of can't even do this frequently. So even if you flush the caches there may not be a way to ensure that um, the stuff actually hits the disk when it comes available. Um, and it, it, this is also not, not something that's explicit. Um, it's not like a handler you pass around. You don't pass around the file descriptor that's going to an IO barrier. It's just going to go to some other place. You just do it as part of the IO stream in your application library. So here's just a, a really basic example. You've got like a stream of IO coming from your app maybe some reads and writes, then you've got a barrier inserted and then some writes. So your barrier just ensures that those previous accesses have completed and that write has landed on disk before you get to the next write. Um, and so that's how you can kind of guarantee some sort of atomicity and, and metadata consistency. So th moving on to the graphic side, it's actually very similar. Um, NVIDIA added, added this to GL way back in the uh, GL 1.0. Their GPU hardware, and so they wanted a way to do to do uh, synchronization, especially so that they could 
uh, allow applications to kind of read and write buffers um, with CPU and GPU um, in, a f in a finer grained way than you know having just GL storage the whole the whole operation. Um, so that that has the potential to really improve performance. So in this example, you can see we've got several contexts. Um, Featured in submitting batches, this is the, the gray blocks for the batches and the, and the, uh, the red blocks for the sensors. So you can see like in context A, we submit some work, maybe the second batch acts just as a buffer, but once that fence is passed, then you know that the CPU knows, okay, I can start accessing this buffer now because it's, it's, it's consistent with the rest of the, the GL stuff. Um, but you don't have to do a GL fin finish of you know, your whole operation. So that can really improve performance because now you can kind of you know, mess with your updated vertex buffers while you're still kind of just running all the work. Uh, and in the MD Fence case, the, the namespaces are per context. So you can see context A and context B each, each have a, a fence ID of one and then um, you have to change the, the recent stuff on the, on the MD Fence to kind of follow those rules. Um, so this was a big, big improvement for GL. As such, it was uh, thrown in, into Augsburg. So this one was added like a while after, but I think a lot of people implemented MD Fence uh, anyway. So it's pretty similar. Um, it does add a few things. It, it, the namespace is now shared across contexts, so that just makes it a little easier out on the application side to manage your, your fence ID. You don't have to worry about mounting a buffer or something. And um, and adds this client server distinction. So in the in the previous case, I'm sorry, the time's up. Um, for these fences, you have uh, operations in GL that allow you to wait on them or check whether they're signaled. Um, the ARP sync uh, implementation allows you to either block your current process or ask the server to block for you. So if you've got like a display server like X or Wayland or Service Link or whatever, um, potentially your implementation can allow you to have the blocking occur there and then you can still queue up those commands and ask for you know, in that uh, wasting CPU, uh, get better CPU uh, efficiency. So that's where kind of we are today at Augsburg. Um, on top of that, the, the Android guys um, were probably the, the first ones to to really put together and ship uh, in a big way these explicit synchronization um, mechanisms. So they added a EGL native fence sync um, extension. So this this is, you know, it's it, it works with the ARB sync uh, framework, um, but it's designed to sit on top of some underlying OS mechanism for synchronization. Um, but you that's provided in an explicit way. So this allows you to import uh, import a file descriptor as a sync object. And then use that like you would an extension, um, so it's pretty pretty handy. And like I said, the Android Sync framework is what that sits on top of, um, at least in the Android case. So, and that's it's currently a, in the Linux version of Dash Two, so it is it is upstream Linux oriented. Um, and it's it's designed to support multiple kernel drivers, um, so it's not just a graphics thing. It's designed to be explicit. It has an API that user space can actually use for waiting on or um, merging or updating um, objects. And on, on the internal side, you'll see it uses these timelines. <coughs> so here we have um, just a, a really simple um, overview of, the, of how Android Sync would work on a, on a machine with multiple devices and drivers. So you, you would generally have a timeline per device or per uh, engine that's that's completing work in some fashion. So in the case that I outlined here, we've got a GPU is just a render pipeline, a video decode pipeline, which may or may not be part of your GPU, and a camera pipeline, you know, getting frames into memory. So you would probably have a timeline for each of those, and then you'd have sync points that correspond to different events on, on, that on those timelines. So for example, a after a video uh, decode frame is done, you'd probably signal uh, a fence signal one of these sync objects that, that, that it was complete, so then if user space wanted to consume that buffer or feed it on onto another driver, it could do that. Uh, similarly, um, you know, the camera side or the GPU side, if you're completing work, you 
Jason was sitting there and, and passed those um, handles out. So this is, this is really uh, in contrast to the DMA fence um, implementation that we have in the kernel today, where this stuff is done implicitly, uh, that there's no reason this issue can't work for gaming. So on to DMA fence. So thanks to Rob and Martin for, for doing that. Um, it, was a, it took a while to, to get it all upstream, but um, it's now really nice, and it's allowed us to simplify quite a bit of code on the drivers. Each of the drivers up to then kind of implemented their own their own form of uh, completion tracking, kind of their own form of fencing internally. So with the DMA fence, we see some reasonable drivers that are sort of using a common set of code and, and an interface that each of us has created. Um, and as I said, it's this uh, internally within the kernel, there are callbacks where you can enable signaling and, and kind of make things explicit if you want, but we also have those uh, implicit. And one of the nice things about this is it allows you to actually use um, hardware to hardware synchronization. So DMA fence could be reimplemented in such a way that say you have your GPU tied to your video decode engine and your video decode engine when it completes a thing can signal via hardware, maybe a wire over to the GPU that it completes, DMA fence can kind of help you with that too. Um, whereas I think the, the Android sync framework would have So on the i915 side, we don't use DMA fences yet. Um, that's kind of a work in progress. It's a kind of a big, a big shift for us. We did just make a big change over to using our own um, request tracking structure because we're getting ready to go um, out of order in terms of our um, command permissions. We're going to be adding a GPU scheduler, so we needed to move over to that. But the next logical step is to use DMA fences instead of our own request tracking structure. So we're working on that. All of the synchronization today in IMM15 is, is implicit. So going back, going back to uh, this example, um, rather than having fences uh, in your command stream, um, today the buffers kind of act like fences. So for example, if, if context B submits some work that depends on or consumes uh, some of the uh, buffers that context A has read or written, the kernel will auto automatically synchronize that for you and make sure that the, the operations occur in order, rather than user space having to create a fence, wait on it, and then submit the work and then wait for it to be done. So all of the synchronization, that's what I mean when I say it's all uh, implicit today. Um, on, the, on the other hand, because we're using buffers and, and this synchronization is provided, you can actually use buffers as kind of a, um, a fence-like object. And so if you look at the FNA code, Chris has done a lot of, a lot of things like that to kind of make sure that he doesn't add bubbles to the pipeline. Um, so th the plus side of the, implicits of the implicit synchronization is it's really easy for user space to get it right. They don't have to worry about ordering. They don't have to worry about buffer dependencies. The kernel just takes care of it for them. On the, on the downside, it's you don't have as much visibility into what's going on necessarily, especially if we're adding a scheduler in the future. And so it'd be really easy to add bubbles to the pipeline waiting on buffers that, you know, you could have submitted things out of order and kept the GPU busy and then a bunch of other things happened. So that's kind of one of the downsides of the implicit synchronization is it's, it's easy, to <laughs> easy to be inefficient. Um, and as I said, the, bu the buffers can actually be used as an implicit synchronization because you can query a buffer status and see if it's done. Um, there's, a, there's a downside though, using buffers is not quite the same as having a, a dedicated baby application that handles that kind of stuff. So the, the plans and the, we have actually implementations for this today on their way upstream. Um, the buffer independent synchronization gets at some of the some of the questions that the users are looking at. Um, so the plan here is to add add flags to some of the existing IOCTAs like the check buff. Um, so when you submit a, a batch to a GPU, you can submit a flag with it saying I want to get back a fence for this uh, batch. All the internals, as I said, we're going to move over to DMA fence fences and, and really get that all code and integrated. <coughs> and the, on the user land side, we'll support this, the Android Sync Fence ABI, just because it's been there's no real need to invent a new ABI when the Android Sync Fence um, framework already has one, and it's it's a reasonable one, so we'll just use that. Um, and then 
other entry points. So it's not just uh, the GPU rendering, it's also the display side where you need um, where you need to know when things happen. So today we actually have um, page split completion event, and we'll be tying those into the front uh, API as well. So you'll get some progress back and you'll be more stressed for page splits. Um, so that you can synchronize things up in your in your display server. Um, and as I said, the GPU scheduler is coming, which should be really cool. That should actually allow the kernel to get better utilization um, of the GPUs rather than stalling it on uh, Intel and semaphores or anything like that. Um, and it should also allow us to prioritize that for display if we've got your display server needs to get something on the screen, otherwise your user experience suffers. It can, it can do that at the expense of some of the other applications that might be um, dominating one day we'll, uh, Gen 7 parts don't have um, real preemption, it's more of a cooperative preemption where you insert uh, arbitration points and it can preempt those points, but future GPUs have preemptions that we can, we can actually preempt, uh, which would be really cool. Uh, so that'd be a real scheduler. On the Mesa side, I uh, did some simple patches to Intel at Sync in terms of the Sync packages today. It's just uh, done as buffers um, and that, that's, that's really trivial to do. It doesn't really add a whole lot in terms of some implementation detail for Mesa, but uh, it makes it makes the code pretty pretty simple. So getting back to the questions, um, one of the big ones, uh, what if you don't have buffer handles? Um, it's really hard to do buffer-based synchronization if you don't have buffers. So uh, sync fences uh, and explicit synchronization help us get around that. So we can, we can actually query for command completion and things like that, uh, even though there are no buffers involved. Again, if, if you're passing the driver just a, a pointer to say, hey, go run this, I don't really know what you're accessing or care, um, we can get fences back for that as well um, and synchronize against it without having to have knowledge of the buffers. Um, same for the ring three, the ring three case. In the ring three case, the kernel driver isn't even aware of what's being submitted. But there are still cases where you want to synchronize. So in that case, you do have to involve the kernel DA and say, hey, give me a, give me a fence. I just submitted some ring. Um, and also, like I said, uh, there's a potential for user space scheduling. So if you've got you know, multiple direct rendering clients uh, all feeding buffers to, say, a Wayland server, um, and you, when, it, when those clients send the buffers to the Wayland server, they also send fences uh, corresponding to those buffers. Wayland can actually do some, do some intelligent scheduling and pick what to do first. Um, so for example, if, if it sees that it's got you know, eight out of nine of the buffers it needs to render the screen and it knows it's gonna take you know, five milliseconds to get everything ready and then render the screen, and there's another client that it doesn't have ready yet and historically has been taking longer, it can query the fence and say, oh, this one's not done, I'm gonna ignore it, use the old frame, uh, and then Wayland can actually render it render its uh, screen frame and keep the user experience as, as good as it can be with um, clients that are, that are running slow. Um, but at least Wayland or your, or your service frame manager or your frame manager is getting its frames up so your user experience isn't lost. So that's one of the nice applications of some of the explicit fencing if you're passing them back and forth with different packages. Um, I didn't mention that the Android Sync framework uses file descriptors. So once you get a sync point from the kernel, it's just a file descriptor. So you can pass it around like you want it or however you want it to be saved. Sync point on October 9th. Uh, on top of that, it becomes a lot easier to debug components on your lockups because you've got this explicit synchronization. So on the Android side, they've got some tools to visualize timelines and they can show you all of the sync points. And because you have these explicit sync points, you can say, oh, it's this, this process, its fence is taking too long on the signal, and then you can work backwards from there uh, and figure out what to do. And then synchronizing execution between two different blocks, we can use the internal DMA fences stuff, or um, we can also use the, the sync fences up in user space. So user space app that's maybe doing camera work and video detail can use these fences to coordinate its activity. Uh, one of the downsides there is then you might add some uh, additional bubbles in the pipeline that may not be as efficient, but uh, possible in some cases. So that's, that's what I have. Any questions on this stuff? Any other important speaking stuff? No? All right. Well, that's all I had. Thanks.